Hey everyone, it's Eric here, and today I wanna to talk to you guys about becoming your own private bank. This is super important, so hear me out. Don't click next or anything like that. Hear me out for the next few minutes and listen to what I gotta say. I guarantee uh, it's new and you won't regret it. I, I guarantee that you need to hear this, okay? So, uh, creating your own private bank, it is what it is. This is the title of it. Um, banking is the most important industry in pretty much any economy. So who is this presentation for? Uh, it's essentially for everyone, but who is this gonna really um, resonate with? It's the conservative libertarian type of folks because they're naturally concerned about government spending. Um, fractional reserve uh, banking is essentially, you know, it creates inflation, makes, uh, it's bad for savers, anyone, you know, on, you know, fixed income, anyone just, it, it, anyone trying to have a decent living has to keep earning more and more money. And it puts pressure on people on the low end of the income scale, as well as savers on the other side. So it really penalizes everyone. Um, but fractional reserve banking, anyone concerned about higher taxes, again, less disposable income to spend on your life, um, deemed this the deemed disposition rule is essentially when you pass away, you have essentially sold all your assets at that time and you have to sell it at fair market value. And, and when you pass away, you got to pay taxes on all the assets you've, you've accumulated um, as if you sold it at that one time. So instead of, you know, spreading out the sale of assets over a course of a few years, it's kind of all done at once. You're kind of lumped into the highest tax bracket and you're paying a, a ton of money when you pass away. Uh, this is for anyone who invests in real estate. You know, you're always buying additional real estate. You're looking for capital to invest. Um, a business owner, you're always looking to buy equipment. Say you're, I don't know, you wanna buy trucks or maybe you're a dentist, you wanna buy equipment for your office. If you're in control of the banking function in your life, you're able to recapture that interest and have control o over the capital and where and where to put it. You don't have to, there's no credit checks, there's no applications because you're the bank and you get to control how you spend um, or how you lend out the money from your bank. Um, another thing, really my favorite, intergenerational wealth. This is crucial and it's not for people who just want to leave a million dollars to their kids that's not what i'm talking about here i'm talking about intergenerational wealth i'm talking about your kids kids your kids 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 okay uh in history there's there have been some you know uber wealthy individuals okay you got the like the vanderbelts you got you got um rockefellers uh the vanderbelts after a few generations those kids actually died very poor they had no money meanwhile at the at the peak they were the richest people they the, their 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 net income was a percentage of gdp right it was it was a huge percentage of gdp right they had a monopoly and um and then a few generations down those people have zero dollars they literally go bankrupt because they just don't know how to control their wealth Whereas you look at the Rockefellers, they knew how to uh, have this wealth last generations. And this is what it's all about. It's about controlling the banking function for you and your family. And with, and with you and your family all bank at the same place, which is your bank, whenever that interest is paid to the bank, it benefits you and all the generations after you directly, right? So this is a really important concept. Um, and it's not about some greedy way to, you know, give a million dollars to your kids. It's a, this is intergenerational, and it allows your kids not, you know, they don't have to start from scratch. They don't have to worry about college education or anything like that. Um, so, the problem. Um, so, so why? Why do you even need to have a private bank, right? Uh, essentially, there's two problems: they're micro and then the macro. On the micro level, you know, just to help you succeed in life, um, 
this will help you. Why? The typical Canadian's household's disposable income is absorbed each month by interest payments to outsiders. Basically, you pay interest, a huge percentage of your salary or your, your monthly income goes to interest payments alone, whether it be mortgage payments, car payments, visa payments, whatever it is, credit cards, it all goes to outsiders. Um, and if you look at, so your mortgage payment and all your payments, um, your, your whatever money you, you, you bring in, and although you might say, oh, I'm only paying 2% on my mortgage, if you look at your mortgage payment, about 50% of that, if it's on the beginning of the mortgage, is interest. So it's not 2%, it's like 30% of your income. Because if you pay, say, two, you know, whatever, $2,000 in mortgage payment, $1,000 of that is interest, and maybe you make $5,000, okay? So that's a huge percentage of your income. It's not 2%. The banks wanna have you focus on the 2%, but what you, what you should be focusing on is the volume of interest that you're paying. Another thing is taxes. Uh, we pay way too much in taxes. This is 42.5% of the average Canadian's income goes towards taxes. And you're like, well, I don't make 40, I don't, I'm not in the 42% tax bracket. I'm in the 25% tax bracket or something like that. Well, this is including everything. This is the average Canadian. This is including uh, your marginal tax bracket, your you know HST, property tax, uh, taxes at the pump when you're paying gas, um, everything, right? So that's 42%. That's the estimated amount that, that you pay. So you can see right off the bat, you know, 70% of your income is leaving you, leaving you and your family. And, and then you're left with the balance to put bread on the table, right? Seems kind of ridiculous. And I compare it to if you could visualize this, if you're a pilot flying a plane and this this plane can go 100 kilometers an hour, um, but the problem is you have a headwind of 100 kilometers an hour. Um, if you're flying at, flying at 100 and the headwind is coming at you at 100, your ground speed is zero. You're not going anywhere. You're actually staying put. And this is the scenario we have today with many Canadians. They're trying to invest their money um, getting two, three, four, five, eight, whatever percent, taking on risk, going to the stock market. And they're trying to make their little plane go 105 kilometers an hour, 110 kilometers an hour, but you have a headwind of 100 kilometers an hour. So you're not going anywhere, okay? So what the problem, my solution is essentially changing the environment in which you operate. So instead of having a headwind of 100, if that pilot landed the plane, waited until the system changed and now you have a, ta um, a tailwind, now that pilot is going to be going 100 kilometers an hour plus the, the tailwind of 100 kilometers an hour. He's going 200 kilometers forward, whereas you know a few hours ago he was staying put and trying to go as fast as he could. So that's the idea here. You want to change the environment in which you operate so you can go further, not trying to rig up the plane to go faster and take on more risk to go faster. Secondly, macro level. This is really speaks to the conservative libertarian. The first problem speaks to pretty much every Canadian. It doesn't matter if you're um, left, right, center, whatever. This affects you. Um, the other, on the macro level, I think this definitely affects everyone, but it will really resonate with conservatives, libertarians, and those types of folks. So why? Because central banks and governments have uncontrollable spending. Um, inflation is coming due to printing money, fractional reserve banking, if, if you don't know what that is. It's basically banks don't have to hold all their cash. They only have to have 10% of it. Um, and this all raises the cost of living. And this creates the, the manipulation of the interest rates and, and the supply of money and government spending. This creates the booms and the busts. This is, it's not capitalism. It's the manipulation 
of the environment you operate, which creates all this. Although they're, they're, they say they're trying to fix it, it's actually the cause of the boom and busts. Okay, so how do you get out of it? We want to create, we want to, we want to provide a solution, right? I presented the problem. The solution seems very difficult to achieve. Really, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is pegging the dollar to a precious metal like gold. This will keep government spending in check because if they print money, too much money, the value will go down. They could. They could sell it for gold and and redeem that gold instead of holding on to the currency. Um, step two would be privatized banking, privatized banking and 100% reserve banking, which would get rid of fractional reserve banking. Um, this would this would eliminate inflationary pressures within the economy. Third, is to get rid of the central banks altogether because at this point we don't even need them. But this seems quite impossible at this point you know so so what is so what is the solution if that seems nearly impossible so let's before we get to the solution let's talk about inflation um because a lot of people i think um are taught this is one thing when it's kind of something else and i admit i i fell into that as well in the past Inflation is the increase in money supply. Okay, we're taught to think of inflation as CPI, okay, consumer price index, as as prices rise, but it's not. Rising prices is the effect of the increased money supply. Okay, and central banks supply banks um, with funds, with money. They print money, and they deposit money. They actually. Um, they control interest rates, but they also um, control the supply of money with like their um, asset purchases. So they could buy assets. And that money goes directly into the banks, the commercial banks. And then although although the the central bank is obviously printing money, money creation and the money multiplier, as they say, um, actually resides in um in the commercial bank and the way we're taught is banks are really the banks are really only borrowing from you say they borrow a hundred dollars from you and then they lend it out for a, they lend out that hundred dollars to someone else right so they borrow at whatever two percent and they lend it out at three percent and and then they make the spread that's what we're taught that is done at the banks and that's how they make money but that's, that's what they do on their GICs and their investments. But there's, a, there, there's another dirty secret that they have, and they don't just make money off that. That's what they're taught. They actually make money off your deposits, all right, that your checking account. You didn't give it to them to invest. You're actually paying them to hold on to your money and have the convenience of using your, your Interact and this and that, right? You're actually paying for them to, to hold on to your money. But what they're doing is they're only holding on to 10% of it. The rest, they lend it out. They're not giving you a rate of return on that money like they do on the other investments. They're only gonna keep 10, 10% and 90% 90% they lend to someone else. Okay? They lend to someone else so that they could, you know, go buy something, right? And that person goes buys a pair of shoes, right? And then that the seller of the pair of shoes goes to their bank and he deposits the $90. That bank only keeps 10 bucks and then lends out 80, right? So if you look at the supply of money, it increases every time the money is deposited into the bank and then re-lent out. So here is the crucial, crucial element of this. If you want to stop the increase of money, we have to stop doing business with the banks, okay? They could only increase money if there's demand for a loan, right? But if you cut off, if, if you cut off the banks and don't um, get the loan, they will essentially have excess reserves, right? So the guy, for example, go back to this example, he deposits $100 into the bank. If they have no one to borrow the $90, 
all of his money stays in the bank. They don't have to get rid of it because if there's no one to lend it to, it's excess reserves. They only need to keep 10% 10, 10 of it, but they can't make a loan, so they're going to keep 100% of it, right? So that's how you could effectively stop the commercial banks from creating money by cutting off the, the demand to the commercial banks. Okay, so um, I know that sounds kind of crazy, um, but that's essentially, if you stop doing business with the banks, you will cut them off and inflation will um, go, go down. It'll, it'll eliminate inflation, essentially, if you, because commercial banks are the cause of inflation. Now, this, so now this slide here, I'm talking about 100% or full reserve banking. So again, most people think bankers or um, banks or bankers as business people who borrow money from one set of people and lend it to another group of people. These bankers charge an interest differential, right? 3% and the 2%. Or at least this is the perception. This form of lending is known as loan banking. And the important distinction is loan banking is not inflationary. Okay? So if I take um, one hundred dollars and loan and 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 then loan it out to some or loan it to the bank and they give me two percent and then he loans it out to another person at 3%, that's not inflationary. The problem is when you lend your money and it keeps going further, you can't stop them from loaning the money out to other people, right? So if I put the money into a checking account, they can't lend it out. If it was 100% reserve banking, um, they can't lend it out to other people. It just stays there. But with a loan and a GIC type of thing, you're giving them permission and you're saying, okay, well, I want to forfeit my access to this cash for a year or whatever it is. And then you could loan it out to this other person. And then that person will pay it back at the end of the three years, right? So say I loaned it to the bank for a year and then they loaned it to some other person who's going to pay it back in one year. So the money goes to that person and it comes back to me in a year. That's not inflationary. The problem, inflationary object, uh, is when you put the money into the bank, they keep 10%, take 90, loan it to someone else who goes to buy a, the shoes, and then that store owner deposits in the bank the $90, the bank takes 80, loans it to someone else who wants to buy a purse, and then puts that into the bank and then that bank loans it out $60 to someone else who wants to buy another pair of shoes and that's the creation of money. It came out of thin air. No one, it, this, this is not, um, so that's the problem. And if you cut off the demand, it all stops. Um, insurance companies, on the other hand, don't do that, okay? Insurance companies, when you the assets that are in the insurance company, they can't lend out more than what they have. They don't, they can't just put numbers on a piece of paper and lend out more um, assets than what they have. They have a million dollars, they're gonna buy assets worth a million dollars and that's final, right? That's it. Um, so insurance companies are not inflationary and um, that's where your money should should reside versus commercial banks if you want to go on the macro level and kind of get out of the system. So it seems impossible, right? Um, I spoke, I, I mentioned before, you know, changing everything to go to the gold standard, you know, that doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Um, getting rid of the Bank of Canada doesn't look like that's going to happen, right? That's going to take a lot of persuasion, a lot of education for the general public to actually kind of vote for that and make that a mandate of one of the, the major political parties. Uh, that ain't going to happen. 
But the privatized banking can happen. It could happen one family at a time. And although it's not going to have a, make a huge dent, one particular family in the whole the system as a whole, <clears throat> but if a large percentage of us do this, you it will make a difference. It will cut off the demand for the loans which create the inflation. And you're doing a favor you're doing a favor for the economy, you're doing a favor for the system, getting out of the system, and you're doing a favor for your family. Like I said on the micro level, you're creating a tailwind and uh, getting out of the headwind scenario. Okay, so if you want to learn more about the banking system, fractional reserve banking, the problem, the the solution, um, I highly suggest you read How Privatized Banking Really Works by Carlos Lara and Robert Murphy. Um, I'll give you the link at the end of the video and uh, it's a short read but it's really good you need to read it if this is uh, slightly interesting to you so like I said infinite banking this is the this is the solution um, and it's not a product although we make use of insurance companies this is a process this is a process of warehousing your money and borrowing against the assets when you need to fund large purchases, such as a house, a car, tuition, whatever it is. And it could be transformed intergenerationally as well. So I think the best way to look at it is going through an example and I'll explain to you how it works, okay? So, say you're gonna buy a car. Um, few ways to look at it you could buy you could go lease a lease route which is you don't own it you're kind of renting it right um, finance it you could finance it basically these two options I don't have the money now to buy it right I need to borrow the money I'm gonna pay you monthly and at the end of the term um, well I've gotten I, I, I've got to use the car for that term say it's five years and but I don't have the money today to pot to, to pay for it all so that's why I need to, those two options. Or I could pay cash. Say I just had $20,000 to pay cash for this car. You could pay cash. But in five years from now, you're going to need another car. So you're going to have to accumulate $20,000 to buy the next car, right? So that's the third option. There's a fourth option, which is what I, what I want to talk to you about. It's IBC, Infinite Banking Concept. So let's go through um, financing versus cash, okay? So the, 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 gra the graph here shows uh, the cash or the financing, how this looks like over time. So if you're financing, you, you borrow $20,000 and then you pay it back. Actually, this, sorry about that. This is actually kind of you borrow 20,000 and then you pay it back. It actually goes up this way. And you borrow 20,000 and then you pay it back. Uh, the other way is if you wanna save 20,000. The problem with this is you don't get to drive a car for the first five years. You have to forego the ability to drive this car. So you can save for the, the car. And then and then when you, when you pay for the car, it drops, your savings drop. And then you you keep saving for this whole time you're, you're you're driving the car and then it drops and you keep saving to buy more and more cars you're always going to buy more and more cars because they deplete the value of the asset depletes it. so in the same way you're always going to have to finance new cars like how many cars are you going to finance over the course of your life is it going to be three five who knows but this is the process you're going to have to be doing this over and over and over again so um, that's the difference. Now look at the IBC method, the infinite banking method. Um, this is now you're getting the best of both worlds. So you're gonna you're going to um, build up cash flow in a 
dividend paying whole our whole life insurance contract at a mutual fund at a mutual company okay so a mutual company is essentially uh, a company where the policy owners own the company it's not shareholders shareholders is not traded on the exchange it's not anyone outside of the policy owners that own the company the policy owners of the whole life policies own the company and they receive dividends directly from the profit the profits of the company um, so the key is it's a dividend paying whole life insurance policy and dividend paying whole life insurance has cash value okay so as you pay for as you pay your premiums um, cash accumulates within the policy now this is not just any whole life policy don't think that you could just go out there and get a whole life policy and this is going to work as i'm illustrating it this is a very specific way of designing it okay this is an overfunded whole life policy where you're buying paid up additions so um, there's an increase in cash from day one you could put the money in and within whatever 30 days you could borrow against that cash okay this is one of the unique things about whole life policies um, so so what happens similar to the cash method where you need to capitalize yourself you need to save the twenty thousand dollars to buy the car you need to do the same thing in the infinite banking concept you can't just go out there and buy the car um, you have to actually save within the policy in order to borrow against against it. But the unique thing about this is that, see this line? It keeps going up. And why is that? So as you save $20,000 in those five years, you get to borrow against the policy and buy that car. Over the course of five years, you pay back that loan. All right, so that loan is paid off. But in the meantime, your assets were growing the entire time. Because what happens is the insurance company doesn't give you back your money. Your money continues to grow. So you have uninterrupted compounded growth. Uninterrupted compounded growth is way better than interrupted growth within the stock market or anything like that this is uninterrupted growth compounded growth over the course of like 20 50 years okay this is incredible and if you know anything about compounded growth and compounded returns is it's exponential growth because you're making money off the money you made okay if that makes sense you making money off the money you already made so if i have a hundred thousand dollars i make five percent I get $5,000 at, at the end of the year. But the following year, I make 5% on 105. And then the following year after that, I'll make 5% on 110, 500 or whatever it is, right? So you're gonna keep growing. And the growth is exponential growth. So as, as this line increases, you're not touching that. The bank is not giving your money back. The bank has a pool of funds on the side and it's going to loan you money as a policy loan from that pool of funds. So your money continues to grow while you get to borrow against it to buy the car. Now, and this really resonates, I think, with people with uh, a house and a rental property. So as you uh, buy a rental property, you could borrow after five years, say you buy a rental property, after five years, you could actually refinance that property, pull out equity to buy another property. And all the while, the asset, the, the house itself is growing in value, right? Just ask anyone who's invested in real estate in the past 10 years. The asset continues to grow in value and you collateralize that asset. So you borrow against it to buy whatever you want. So the real estate investor doesn't have to sell his house to go buy a car. He doesn't sell the house to get $50,000 to go buy a car. He 
takes a loan out and says, if I don't pay you, you could have my house. Obviously, he intends to pay off the loan. But he gets better rates and he could get uh, asset access to that loan um, in direct proportion to how fast or how how large or or how the asset is valued. So if the value of the asset keeps going up, you get a larger and larger loan. Doesn't really happen in real estate because to apply for the mortgage, it does work, but your income has to keep increasing because whenever they give you a loan, they need to make sure that you can repay it. It doesn't happen with life insurance. As this line increases, this cash value increases, because the cash value and the death benefit have to equal when you die at age 100, okay? So this is naturally gonna increase. It doesn't matter. Every single day that you're alive, this cash value increases and you have access to borrow against it every single day. So your cash value increases every single day. You don't need to do an application. There's no credit report. There's nothing. You send in a form to the insurance company. Two days later, you have the funds in your account. Okay, it's that simple. And guess what? You don't even need to pay it back in any sort of structured loan structure. You don't have to say, I'll give you, you know, the money back in 20 years, over the course of 20 years, like a mortgage, 25, 30 years amortization, or five years. You could pay it back immediately the following month, or you could pay back 30 years from now. What happens is the interest is charged and and capitalizes within the policy. So your cash value, your 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 loan balance will increase with the interest. Okay? But let's go back to the infinite banking concept and this idea. The the guy who saved pay back the loan, saved uh saved bought a car, saved, bought the car, saved, bought the car. It's the exact same thing here, right? You save, you buy the car, you save, you pay back that loan. But in the meantime, this continues to go up and you get to borrow against it. And then you pay back that loan, but the asset keeps growing and you get to borrow against it, pay pay back that loan. The asset keep, keeps growing. So, so now your growth is not just... If you want to take down $40,000, you could borrow $40,000 because the asset is growing independent of your loan, okay? They're two separate things. The, the, the contract with the insurance company is saying this contract cash flow will, will, is going to be projected as X and they, they lend you money from a pool of assets that the company has, okay? So... That's how it works. And this is, and imagine not having to pay it back, right? Or having to, you could pay down extra. You, you could pay extra and take it out again the following day. You're not cash strapped. You don't have to go back to the bank begging um, with a new application. So that's, that's one aspect, the easiness, the uninterrupted compounded interest when you're financing things in your life. Um, now let's talk about recapturing interest. Um, there are four um, individuals in finance, I guess personas or, 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 or um, roles within finance. There's the borrower, there's the lender, the saver, the guy who has the money, the bank, and the shareholder, okay? The borrower needs the $20,000. The lender or the saver is the guy who is depositing $20,000 into the bank in a savings account. The bank is making the differential on the interest rates. He's going to charge the borrower 5 and give the lender three right and then they make the the two percent and and the bank executives are going to make their money the employees are going to make their money 
everyone's going to make their money going about this. And whatever's left over, there's the profits, right? Who gets the profits? It's the shareholders. Okay, so those are the four people. Now, most people are borrowers. Fewer people are savers. Nearly no one is a bank. And some people are shareholders, but they have to buy it directly into the company. So how do we do this? If you understand what I was explaining before with the um, dividend paying whole life insurance, whole life insurance from a mutual fund company. Um, this is the banking process. It is not a product. Although you are buying a product, you are using um, the product as a tool to execute the process of running a bank. Okay. If you wanted to run a bank on your own, you would have to go through all sorts of regulatory hurdles. You would have to have millions and millions of dollars and it just, just would never happen. But you could effectively create a bank using the tool of a dividend paying whole life insurance. So how does that work? Um, let's go through one at a time. Premiums. Life insurance, you pay premiums. That, that money goes into the pool of money that's being invested. And when the insurance company, um, when the insurance company projects forward of how much money they need for death benefits, this and that, that's how those premiums are calculated. Um, they take this pool of money and they make policy loans to individuals, like I was explaining before. You could actually say there's $100 million in here. Maybe there's a few people that bought a house through a policy loan. Maybe there's $100,000 in the cash value of their policy. They could borrow up to 90% of that. So $90,000 to go put on a house, uh, to buy a house. And instead of paying a mortgage, they just pay themselves back. They've took a loan against their cash value. They also invest in mortgages. They lend money to other people to buy houses through that pool of money. Joint, joint ventures, they might, if you've ever seen a huge, large commercial project or something like that, a lot of the times insurance companies who, which have a lot of capital are um, the financiers of those projects. They also have to pay out death claims. So as people die, they have to pay out the death claims. They have to pay out expenses, just like the bank has, you know, rep, uh, sales representatives, people on the phone, this and that, admin. They got to pay out the, the um, operations and dividends. So after the whole thing is said and done, they've made their money. They have enough capital to pay out death claims. They're safe for the future because they're very conservative in their investments. Um, they might have excess funds, and typically that would go to a shareholder, right? But with a mutual company, there are no shareholders. The policy owners, the people putting the money into the pool of funds are the people who benefit from all the interest payments to policy owners, all the interest payments paid on all the mortgages that were um, lent out, all the joint ventures, all the profits that come into the pool, all the profits in excess of their requirements to pay out death benefits and pay out the expenses are paid out in dividends. And those are paid back to the policy owners. And through this, you become the borrower, right? You're the policy owner. You're the, you're the saver and the lender as paying premiums. You are the bank because you are the one um, funding this and then loaning out to other individuals, out outsiders, and collecting the interest. And you're the shareholder because you are collecting the dividends. Okay, so I hope, I mean, this. I just scratched the surface of this. I just wanted to demonstrate something new to you that you might not have thought of before. Okay, so you could effectively reclaim, recapture, all the interest you pay to the banks 
by creating your own bank through uh, dividend paying whole life insurance. So what am I proposing here? Yes, I want to, for anyone who wants to get out of the system, they need to do privatized banking. But I think as a whole, any Canadian wanting to take control of their finances have to take control of the banking function in their life. Any business owner, any real estate investor, they need to take control of the banking function within their life, okay? So what are the mechanics again? Just as a quick summary, take out a dividend paying whole life insurance policy provided by a mutual fund company, okay? This is, this is a, over uh, you you pay up paid up additions um, overfunded policy so it accumulates cash right away if you go to an like a another agent they won't even know what, what you're talking about you need to structure the policy perfectly because you could break this if you don't do it right it won't function like this it won't function like a bank if you don't design it like a bank okay so you take out dividend paying whole life insurance policy. Uh, the whole life policy allows the owner to accumulate equity in the policy, like a long-term rental. The asset goes up, you pay premiums, and you get a return. It's not You're not buying this to get a rate of return. You're buying this to change the environment in which you operate. The airplane example. You're buying this to recapture all the interest payments you're paying to outsiders. You're buying this as an intergenerational tool to um, pass on to your kids and so they don't have to start from scratch. This is You're not buying this for a rate of return. This is not a and uh, like an or, like invest in your, R, R, your, R, your RSPs or invest in real estate or invest in in this life insurance policy. No, this is not an investment. This is an and asset. You own it at all times. So you put the money into the policy and then you collateralize that loan. You borrow it back to invest in your RSPs or invest in real estate and invest in all these other things. But this is the centerpiece. Okay? It's the it's not you don't do it this or that. You do this and you do all these other things, okay? That is a key thing to understand because a lot of people think you're buying a like a product or anything like this. No, this is a process, okay? And this is and the whole life just so happens to be the centerpiece of this process. So the policy owner can take out policy loans with the with um, with the credit limit relative to the cash value. So there's no prepayment schedule, no lengthy applications. Obviously, you don't want to, you're running a business here, right? You have this bank. You don't want to bankrupt your bank. So you need to repay back the loans. You, gotta, you need to pay back the interest just as you would a regular bank. You got to be an honest banker, all right? So that's step four. Pay back the loan and be an honest banker because you're running a business here, okay? And as you pay back the loan, you'll have more capital to invest in other things. But you need to pay back the loan and be an honest banker in order to succeed in this. So again, this is you could buy a whole life dividend, uh, a dividend paying whole life insurance, but you're but you're 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 not going to be practicing banking if you don't don't understand the process. So you could completely break this process if you don't understand what you're doing. Um, step five is again the process be the banker for you and your family and for your future generations okay so if you want to learn more I highly suggest you learn uh, you read private how privatized banking really works and becoming your own banker by Nelson Nash okay two critical books that you should read maybe you if you're um, really want to understand the whole fractional reserve banking, the banking system that we operate in, this is the right book for you. If you want to go straight into how to design a bank and become your own banker, you may want to read this one. Um, but you can get both books at infinitebanking.com. 
infinitebanking.org, okay? You could go to infinitebanking.org. You could buy these, you know, uh, Kindle format or physical format or ebook, whatever it is. But I highly suggest, highly suggest you do that. Also, you could talk to me. I could um, do a more in-depth demonstration of how this works, do an illustration, and you'll see exactly how this could change your life and give you a tailwind and, and take control of the banking function in your life. So thanks for watching. I hope you watched until the end. Thank you for watching until the end. If you would like to share this or you know someone who might benefit from this or, um, you know, this is even someone who you might want to bounce some ideas off of, give it a shot, you know, share it with them and see, do you see anything wrong with this? And, 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 and before you, you know, really criticize it, criticize it, try, try reading the book. Um, you there, there's a lot of, um, negative stuff about people say about this, um, because people feel like, um, it's just a way to make premium uh commission salesperson but I, i'm practicing this and i can tell you that this definitely works and it has uh changed everything in terms of growth and access to cash okay so again thanks for watching reach out to me with any questions um read the book go online get the pros and the cons i'm sure you'll find tons of stuff on it um, and I would love to answer any of your questions. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone.